she sort of gets messages from the animals, and she um, perceives that uh, she perceives them in a light quite different from everybody else on the safari. And uh, she, for example, she um, there's a, their first day out. There's a cheetah, and the cheetah has cubs. And uh, the guide is saying, "Where? What is she doing? Where is she going?" And because there's a gazelle over here, but she's going in this direction, and she goes after a lowly African hare. And so the lesson that I wrote in my journal is. Um, be humble, not proud, because she needed to feed her um, her young ones, and um, so she did that rather than take a chance on the gazelle. So she's Sarah is always getting these messages, or thinks she is, and writing them in her journal about the animals. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Amazon. Is it on Kindle? It is. Okay, great. Yes. Uh huh. A big book. <laughs> well, you know, um, there's like actually, a, we're doing a special right now, and it's a lower price on the Kindle than it will be as of tomorrow. So if you can get it today, it'll be a good price. Any other questions? Yes? You said you would like to meet Jenny. Did you see an actual person that you embellished on? Uh, he was an actual person that I embellished on, uh -huh. <laughs> and he, um, but he was larger than life. If this was ever done as a movie, the person that I see playing him is Liam Neeson, who, you know, has that big, strong personality, and I can just see him bursting through the door. Uh, but. Um, Yes, it is based on an actual person. Would a way to resolve that be what me and an author might do to bring that character out more fully in the following book? I'm sorry, would you repeat the question? Uh, in lieu of meeting him again personally or meeting him personally, one way to develop that um, possible or fictional relationship would be to develop that character in another book. That's the sequel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The sequel starts with them getting together right. because the person that he was with when Sarah was there has died. She's gotten a divorce and Brandon contacts her, a fictional character, Brandon. Mm -hmm. And so they start a relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody else? Did you take um, classes or anything on how to write a book? No, you know, that's, I'm glad you asked that started? question because I've always been waiting for somebody to ask that. Um, I belong to the Northern Trust Literary Society and they have an author come in once a month and they give you the book ahead of time and you read it and so forth. And they always start <coughs> off with their bona fides saying, you know, I went to this writer's workshop and uh, that one, and I won this prize and that prize. And I'd have to start off by saying, I never went to a writer's workshop. <laughs> I, I never even graduated from college. Um, but I think that um, what happened is that um, it just almost channeled through me, if that makes any sense. It was just an easy book to write. Uh, I mean, you when you write a book, you have to go over it a million times. But it was an easy write, uh, write for me because um, I felt so strongly for each of these fictional characters. But no, I've never taken a class or won an award or anything. Although I have submitted, and maybe I'll write, I'll win an award with this book. We'll so see. did you use a thesaurus as part of your? Um, no. no, so no. all your vocabulary is yes. already there. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, when I was uh, in high school, I, I went from a public high school to a <coughs> private high school in Ojai, actually, the Ojai Valley School, mm. and I was put back a grade. I was so humiliated. So that summer, I told my mother, 
who have no money, go buy me as many 3 by 5 index cards as possible. And for some reason, my intuition said, memorize the entire Webster's Dictionary, and then you'll be smart. And so every day, I would memorize 10 words. The next day, I would review those words and then add 10 more. And I did this all through the summer. And when I got back to school, I was on the honor roll every single month. And it had nothing to do with vocabulary. It was just this confidence that I had built in myself. And so, yes, I have a, I have a pretty good vocabulary. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> Any other questions? I'm enjoying this. Come on. <laughs> I was impressed with your vocabulary. <laughs> what is that word? <laughs> it fit. It sounded good. <laughs> well, that's one of the advantages of can yeah. do something that shows you what the right definition is. Right. Okay. Well, we hope you get a very quiet place where you can finish your second novel because I want to know what happened. <laughs> I will say at the very end of book when I was finishing it last night, I <clears throat> I told you, I, I was thinking, how is she going to wrap this up? <laughs> you know, there were different characters, and uh, she was on a road to recovery, but it was, there were just so many little things, I thought, how is she going to do this? <laughs> I'm reading <laughs> and, like, and You will enjoy it. And, and it comes together. Ending. It yeah. came together. I have one more question. Sure. So as you were writing, did you have an outline of where you were going, or did it just flow as you went? I have no outline. No outline. So no. it just, the it, story just right. created itself. Uh, I'll tell you um, one of the things which you don't know based on the fact that I didn't read that part, but the beginning, chapter one, starts with Sarah going to Nio House, which is a government uh, facility in Nairobi, which is the guide's worst nightmare. And he has been incarcerated there. And because Sarah is completely out of her mind, she is um, really throwing her weight around and acting ridiculously in front of these bureaucrats and taking her life into her hands. She professes to be a friend of the President of the United States, and on and on and on. And um, that continuation of what's happening at Nio House is, um, the prep is not the preface, but it's italicized at the beginning of each chapter. Chapter 2 starts the safari, and that goes on until the two timelines intersect. Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but, uh, oh, so, yeah, I, uh, you know, I played around with things. I remember once going to a hotel uh, in, in Beverly Hills and cutting up all the pages and then just rearranging them like a puzzle. And, um, but I, I didn't do the things that people normally do. Well, I'm not normal, but I, I didn't do the things that people normally do, like do an outline. All the things they tell an author to do, a writer, I didn't do it. And it seemed to work okay in this, in this particular instance. We'll see with the next book how it goes. Are all your facts pretty correct for Africa? Did yes. You, did you? Oh, yeah, I mean, I hope so after going back that many times, right? Yes. Yeah, the, the facts about Africa and the facts about the animals and the facts, as I represented Brandon, um, telling me those, those facts are all true. So it took you 20 years. Well, so when did, like, when you got back from Africa, from your major, I guess, your first trip, then did you, have, did you take journal notes or anything like that? I took journal notes when I was in Africa the first time. Right. But... You, could, you couldn't, if I brought it today and I showed it to you, you wouldn't even be able to read it because I was so out of my mind um, and my hand was shaking so much. But I did go back four or five more times after that and um, so I was able to clarify things about animal behaviors and about Africa and about um, the politics and, and so forth.
you'll learn a lot from the book. Yeah, there's nothing about Africa itself that I, that I made up. Um, that's that's fiction. I mean, the book is fiction, but um, what is in here about Africa is true. Like even the part I read you with um, Richard Leakey, I mean um, Brandon Howard, talking about um, Kenyatta and making people be able to own their own land, that's all true.